So it's my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome today Cynthia Brazil, Associate Press Professor at the Media Lab at MIT. Uh, Cynthia, is, as many of you know, is a pioneer in the area of social interactive robots and uh, has spent many years addressing issues of uh, gaze, uh, interaction, expression, gesture, societies, um, both on both sides of the equation, both in terms of what the robots do and what the, what the, the humans do and what the robots can, can gather from, from humans. Um, she has looked at uh, many interesting aspects of human-robot social interaction, including uh, perspective taking and joint, and joint attention, and has developed many amazing artifacts, uh, so several very engaging robots that have been used to test the theories and uh, further the field. Um, most recently, she has been uh, looking at how these types of technologies can aid people uh, to improve their quality of life and their everyday living. And I think there'll be some of that in, in the talk. Yes? Well, well it's a, a little more abstract. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> and um, uh, all right. So without further ado, uh, please please join me in welcoming Cynthia Brazil. Great. Well, thank you very much. So is this good? Is, can, you, can you all hear me? So uh, I want to thank Reed and Manuela for inviting me uh, out to speak with you. I've had, I mean, a really fabulous time seeing old friends. And I mean, you already know this, but I, I've just been very impressed with the students. The students you have are really remarkable. So I've really enjoyed uh, my conversations with them as well. So when I was asked to give the talk, I was trying to think about, you know, what slice through the research, what theme should I try to present around? And I changed the title a bit because I thought this one might be a fun topic to address that there's not as much work going on, I think, in this question of robots that learn from anyone um, uh, across a lot of the labs all over the country. There's a lot of work on social judgments and collaborative tasks, but I thought this might be a little di different kind of lens than maybe what you're usually uh, used to seeing. So I direct the personal robots group at the Media Lab, and so as you might imagine, I mean, the vision is robots for everyone, robots that are really part of the human environment where I really do think we're, we're at a point now where robotics is kind of where personal computers were in the 1970s where now they're starting to get out there. So the question of how do you build robots that can really interact with anyone is become a really interesting and an important question. And I mean anyone from little kids, grandparents, people who know nothing about robotics. Um, and what we've been finding through our work is this kind of technology hooks into our social psychology. It triggers these perceptions of animacy that I think, especially when you talk about lay people, their model of these robots is a, is a richly social model. And by social, I mean it's a psychological model. They don't think of these, these kinds of, uh, of robots, even the Roomba necessarily. It's funny when you, when the, uh, you've done a lot of these studies yourself, these year-long studies showing the, the social implications of people naming these technologies, people describing their behavior in terms of goals, beliefs, and so forth. So, I think if this is unavoidable. This is how people are just from our brain and our evolution in inclined to, to interact with these sorts of systems. So the question is, how do you support it? How do you support it? And in the focus of this talk, I want to uh, probe this question of, you know, there's a lot of un uh, appreciation in the field of it's going to be very hard to program everything explicitly into these systems. You're going to have to be able to learn on the job from anyone. Um, so what should that look like? How do you actually build robots that can learn from people who know nothing about robotics? Um, and so we've started exploring this work uh, around 2006, 2007. Um, and through this talk, I want to go through a series of examples with you to show you how our, you know, in my group, our own thought process has been evolving over time. Um, and at the end of the talk, I actually want to present a project that is very, very, very new. You're getting a sneak peek <laughs> on this data. So if some of the slides look a little rough, it's because we're literally starting to go through the data now, but I'm very excited about it. So I wanted to, to share that with you. Um, that's going to be kind of shaping, I think, the kind of work that my group does for the next five or 10 years or so. So, so you're going to be the first ones to kind of see this, this next step in our evolution of our thinking. So when we began this work, um, this question of building robots that can learn from people, of course, was nothing new. There was a lot of work going on and learning through imitation, learning through demonstration, and so forth. But often what you would see is situations like this, where the robot would learn a task, often in a highly abstracted environment. And I mean, we're still doing that too. But the bigger thing was it was often the student 
who designed the robot and programmed the robot was also the one teaching the robot and then reporting on the results of the teaching. So we weren't really exposing these systems to people who had no familiarity with robotics to see how they would teach robots. So it ended up kind of fostering this sort of model where you had your machine learning algorithm and the person who designs the robot knows exactly how to get this thing to work the way they want to work. And so not surprisingly, you would get the outcome you want. But it was a very sort of machine learning, robot focused uh, kind of process, I think, when the user had deep knowledge about the algorithms. Ultimately, I'm interested more in this situation. <laughs> And you know, it's a lot more dynamic. These people don't necessarily have a lot of experience in interacting with robots, but I don't know, kids today are starting to build their own robots, and maybe in 10 years that's going to be a totally different story. But, but they do bring a lifetime of experience in teaching and learning from each other. So I started this work by thinking about how can we start to really try to understand first how do people approach the task of teaching robots before we start diving into the algorithms and the technologies or try to get them to learn from people? Just let's empirically ground it a bit in human behavior. And what we've been finding is we've been doing a series of studies, series of projects I'll touch a few upon uh, today, is that it is this richly collaborative model where we talk about the person guides the robot's learning, guides the exploration, tries to nudge them on an interesting path. But also, it turns out that the way the robot expresses its behavior to you, its understanding, its attention, subsequently guides the human's instruction. So this is a very tight loop. It's a very collaborative loop of guiding the learning and guiding the subsequent uh, teaching, where the transparency of the learner state is very important for the person to develop the right mental models. What does this robot understand, not understand yet? What's it capable of? What's it tending to? Um, and they use this information in order to try to create their intentions. Do I want to direct the robot's attention? Do I want to give it feedback? Do I want to praise it, reinforce that? As well as the scaffolding. How do I scaffold this learning process? So it's a very different sort of dynamic than I think this, this previous uh, model suggested. And so I want to, again, touch on a few studies to show you how we've been coming up with this other kind of model for how we think about this task of learning from anyone. So, you know, I'm going to talk about robot learning, but I'm actually not going to talk that much at all about the actual underlying learning algorithms. For us, we often cherry pick, you know, we go out into the machine learning field and we just choose the algorithms that seem important, but that actually isn't the focus of the work. What we're trying to look at is the social layer, the external social layer, and what are the implications of that, of how people teach robots that impact what are the kinds of abilities, the kinds of skills that the robot needs to have embedded within its cognitive architecture, and also how might that impact the kinds of inputs or the kinds of framing that the machine learning architecture can have to help frame what the actual turning a statistical crank might have to do. So, the talk and the, 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 the contribution I'm going to make is really about these two arcs rather than talking a lot about the underlying machine learning algorithm, so to speak. So the first project I want to talk about is, is Sophie. And so, you know, at MIT and a lot of labs, I mean, it's, robots just don't interact with a lot of people. <laughs> so trying to bring robots to the place where lots of people interact with them is very hard. So we thought, can we build an online game to study it first, just to get lots and lots of people interacting with an AI online to try to understand something about, again, how people approach the task of teaching a robot. So we created a decidedly not social anthropomorphic robot here called Sophie. And Sophie's task is to bake a cake. So the game is, you know, you basically log on to the game and you're instructed to, to teach Sophie how to bake, bake a cake where there's objects like flour and the bowl and eggs and so forth. So you gotta put these things together, stir it and put it in the oven. So there's a number of steps you have to go through in order to learn this task. People are allowed to instruct the robot for as long as they can until they're convinced Sophie knows how to do it. And we explicitly told them that the robot understands feedback. So it can understand when it does an action, how you're you know, rewarding or, or uh, discouraging that action. So, oops, is this gonna, here's, here's a video of what the game looks like. So we record the entire game log where people have a mouse and they can give a variable level of green means positive and red means negative um, as they choose, uh, as they go through teaching this robot. So we basically just used Q learning, kind of generic uh, reinforcement learning algorithm and recorded data over 200 people over a series of spirits in order to try to understand something about what are people doing when they're trying to teach this even simple agent? What do they do? How are they thinking about this tax? And so one of the interesting things we found that surprised us um, was you saw a lot of behaviors like this. So if you watch this video, 
what they're trying to say is, Sophie, pick up the bowl. The bowl is good. Do something with the bowl. But of course, in reinforcement learning, if you're giving a lot of positive feedback, you're just saying, bowl on the shelf is good. This data is good, right? So in some sense, you're doing you know, something that's really going to slow down their learning process for the robot. But it's important to think about the intention of what people are trying to communicate through this one signal. So if you look at the number of people who actually did this behavior of actually awarding an object versus the overall state of the robot, you get a pretty broad spectrum. But a lot of people did it, at least some. The only people who did it very little were actually people who knew something about reinforcement learning. So this guidance, this guidance behavior is something we see quite a lot. And I think that actually has some pretty interesting implications when you think about how you would design a learning system, a reinforcement learning system, if this is what people are trying to do. So we did this simple addition to the interface where we would allow people to actually highlight, they would do a left click or whatever, right click, um, on the object in order to highlight it. And in the general flow of the algorithm, basically what this would do would bias the robot to do something with that object. So as if you were trying to get the robot to pick up the bowl, it was much more likely to actually do something associated with the bowl. So now you start to see something that looks more like this. So people might reward the eggs, and the robot's just basically much more likely to do something with the eggs. So the question then is, so this is good. You're supporting people's intents in a more, a more appropriate way. But it's also interesting in that it has a big impact on the efficacy of how the robot learns as well. So you know, in terms of the overall numbers of trials, the robot was much faster. The overall number of actions it took was fewer. It had fewer failures. It had fewer failures before it achieved the first goal. And it kind of was able to stay more in the sweet spot of kind of the reasonable actions. Rather than having to explore the whole space, it tended to be more clustered around the sensible actions and the sensible part of the space. So not only does this better support what people want to do to teach it, it actually helps the algorithm or the robot learn as well. So another thing that we found which is a little surprising, perhaps, is that people's reward schedules of how much positive versus negative reward they gave um, was very biased towards much more positive than negative. So these are examples of distributions, even very early on in the task, where the robot is doing a lot of stuff wrong. So why are people giving so much positive feedback to the robot when it's rarely doing the right thing? So again, this is another question in terms of what is going on in the psychology of the person to want to do this. So one hypothesis was they're probably just trying to encourage the robot. They don't want to discourage this. And I think there's been other papers by Brian Scazzolati's group showing that, in fact, people do do this behavior. They actually don't want to overly discourage the robot, and then it might give up. So they tend to over give positive feedback early on. The other hypothesis we had was that it could be that you know, if you give the robot positive reinforcement on an object, you could immediately see the robot take that advice or do something that you intended with it. But in the case of the negative, you didn't see that immediately reflected in the agent's behavior. And so it could be that people thought, it's either not paying attention to me or something, so they would be less likely to do it. So we changed the interface in another way. And we added this ability that you could basically undo, if possible, you could undo the last action. So if you did a negative uh, feedback thing, if the robot could step back and try again, it would do that. So again, that would give you people an immediate sense of the robot was listening to me, um, was taking the negative reinforcement and doing something sensible with it. So we did another experiment with 98 participants with these two conditions of with the undo behavior and without the undo behavior. And again, you see another boost in the learning performance of the robot in terms of these same sorts of measures. So the overall story here is, you know, by first trying to understand something about people's psychology and trying to teach these agents, we got some insight in terms of how we can tinker with the underlying flow of information to the learning algorithm to not only make it much more sensible for the person, but also improve the robot's learning performance as well. So this is, you know, kind of a, a first step that illustrates, first of all, just appreciating that people had multiple intentions when they were trying, even though you gave them just one signal initially, they were using it to communicate a lot of things. There was guidance, there was reinforcement, and then there was you know, motivation. So they were applying a social psychological model to this agent, something that could have an intentional set, something that could be motivated to use the signal in that way. And also, by adding these other things that was apparent in the robot's behavior that it listened to that signal and responded in the appropriate way, you saw a much better sort of loop here in terms of the transparency of the robot's behavior and how people would then subsequently reward or send the signal to the robot to get the right sort of behavior. So 
this is sort of the first, uh, first series of experiments we did to try to explore the space of kind of more of an empirically grounded sense. So, and then we can think beyond this. So, you know, could there be other roles for other kinds of social abilities in robots that are going to be important um, from learning, uh, learning with people in the real world? And so, um, one of the abilities that we were implementing into our robots for collaborative reasons was essentially this idea of kind of a, 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 a theory of other mind module. So the ability for the robot to watch what a person was doing in order to try to infer not only what beliefs the person might have about the situation, but the intentions as well. So kind of having the robot have a social cognitive model of the human as well. And the general framework we used for that was actually inspired from development of psychology, was just appreciating, you know, again, this is taken from a lot of infant development, but being a self uh, in a world with other agents like you, there's correlations between what you look like and what the other agents look like, between your behaviors and between how other beha uh, behaviors of other agents that are like you. And if you can do the sort of simulation thing of imagining if I were like that other entity doing those sorts of things in that sort of situation, then maybe I can start to make predictions of the internal reasoning, the underlying beliefs or intentions that govern that behavior. So the simulation theoretic approach. So. Around 2004 or 5, we started implementing this sort of simulation theory architecture within these robots by which the same mechanisms that the robot would use to generate its behavior, it would run in an internal loop and try to basically map a person onto that and be a little simulator for the person in order to try to figure out, well, if you know, I were the person doing that in that context, maybe this is what I'd be trying to achieve, and then use that in order to reason about how might I best try to help this person. So we've been developing this, this, this simulation theoretic Architecture. So here's um, an example of that. So this is an example of, of basically that. So we, d we designed a task that's very much inspired by the false belief tasks um, in developmental psychology. So in developmental psychology, um, children around three to four years old start to uh, appreciate that other people can have beliefs that are different from their own. Um, and so in this task, the, the general framework of this false belief task is during the task, there's sort of a trick that's played on one of the people when another one leaves. And can the robot appreciate that the person that left now is gonna have different beliefs than the person who actually witnessed the event? So this is a collaborative task, very much inspired by these sort of Sally Ann false beliefs tasks. So there's a Vicon system in the, in the environment you can see markers on people's heads, on the boxes, on these two food items called chips and cookies. So the robots, Leonardo here is actually able to track all of these things that are happening, what people are touching and pointing at. There's also here, you'll see there's a little control panel that can operate two control panels out here that the robot can actually take an action in order to help a person. So, um, so there's these two food items, these chips and these cookies, and again they're marked up so the robot can tell which one's going in which box. And the goal is that the robot's going to try to be helpful to make sure that you get your desired food item, where first you put the food items in these cases, and then you lock them up so that it's harder to get at the food item. This is just, the, again, this argument of there's a selfish simulator architecture we've been developing. So the robot is basically running an internal simulation after doing a perspective taking on what you would see in order to try to reason about what are your goals, what are your beliefs. Given that, do you have false beliefs? If you have a false belief, do you have an invalid plan? And if so, what do I need to do to help you? So that's just kind of what this is about, is showing that sort of uh, architecture. So one of the people leaves, this is Matt, so you see there's a control panel for Leonardo. Um, and so this is the trick. While Matt's gone, Jesse actually switches the food items. And Leo is seeing all of this, and Leo's actually trying to track Matt's beliefs because he's gone, so he didn't see this, and Jesse's beliefs because he's there, as well as the robot's own beliefs, because it can see everything as well. <coughs> and then again, Jesse closes them and locks them up, and then he leaves. Now Jesse seals the boxes with combination locks, preventing easy access to the snacks. <coughs> And now Jesse leaves. <coughs> and Matt comes back. So when Matt returns, hungry for a bag of chips. So Matt wants the chips. So he goes to the box where he thinks the chips are. But of course the chips have actually moved. So he goes to the wrong box. So the point here is that Leonardo is able to reason that because Matt didn't see this difference, this switch happen, his va his beliefs are 
false, they're wrong. Leo actually knows the true beliefs, but he can figure out if mass beliefs were wrong and he was going to this box. He probably wanted the chips, even though the robot knows chips aren't in that box anymore. But he understands that was Matt's intention, so now it's going to try to plan its own course of action. What do I need to do to operate this control panel to open up one of these boxes that's going to reveal the desired food item? So that's how Leonardo helps. He's making a decision based on he knows what your goal is now uh, to try to give you what you want. So there he opens up the chips. Thanks, Leo, yeah. And then, of course, Jesse comes back. Now he returns and tries to open the same box. So now you have the exact same action on the exact same object, but of course, Leo knows that Jesse has true beliefs of the situation. Therefore, he can infer what Jesse's goal target item must be, and now he's going to operate the control box to make sure that Jesse gets the other food item, which are the cookies. So again, just appreciating that we're starting to think about in the area of robotics, rather than focusing on just pure symbolic approaches, how can the robot read nonverbal behavior and real action in order to make these inferences, these internal inferences of these mental states. So that's kind of the new thing I think that robotics is bringing, as well as how do you harness the body itself and the body representations in order to make these inferences. So if anything, this is very much inspired by kind of the body theories of cognition as well. So the robot has this perspective taking, belief inferencing sort of ability. And so one question we had was, does this play a role in learning? If somebody's trying to teach you something, does this more social cognitive ability matter in terms of how you interpret the demonstration of the instructor, especially if that demonstration is ambiguous or is in a messy environment, or what the instructor might be intending to teach you actually as an instance itself isn't a good example of what you're trying to learn from. So our thought was this perspective taking ability could be an important filter on what the demonstrator's demonstration was really trying to get at. So, uh, so this is the question. I mean, does the social context matter? So let's say you have a situation where you have a demonstration. There's a visual occlusion here. It turns out there's a blue block behind that occlusion. If you demonstrate an instance of a concept like fill all the holes with a, a, a limited set of examples so it's ambiguous into what the, 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 the ultimate rule is, does this differ from just seeing all the demonstrations on a screen? So removing the social context that there was a person here and just seeing what that learner would have lear seen anyway if you just saw, say, these PowerPoint slides. So again, does the social context matter in how we interpret examples? And the hypothesis was, yes, it probably does, where if there's a person here doing the demonstration with these blocks, appreciating that they can't see this means that you're going to consider this as a sample set that you should be paying attention to in the demonstration, whereas if you're taking it just as an image off the screen, you might assume that all of the sample set is something you should be paying attention to. So this is about what matters. When I'm watching a demonstration, how do I figure out what matters that I should be paying attention to? And the social cognitive ability might be an important skill in order to figure that out. So we did a task um, where we had kind of similar theme. One was the filling blocks and holes, whereas a visual occlusion one was putting beads on certain colored objects, and you had to figure out the rule for what, what kinds of objects get the beads on top of them, where there was no visual occlusion, but the person would focus on kind of a subset of the blocks. So would ro a robot pick up on this was the intended set to pay attention to versus all of the blocks. And then more of these construction tasks, where did they mirror it to see it in, front of, in terms of what the structure would see if they saw it from their perspective, or did they build it in a way that it was from the robot's perspective? So kind of did they mirror it or not? So again, how much did they take the perspective of the instructor into account in order to learn these rules and these tasks. So, so the first thing is just, okay, so let's, let's uh, have a hypothesis that this perspective taking actually is important. And we did this in a simulator because the robot actually can't put pegs in holes. But we tried to replicate a robot situation and replicate that with a human instructor situation. So a person can demonstrate these tasks for the robot. This is one example of learn, put all, you know, fill all the holes where it would do one instance with the red and green and maybe another one with the red and yellow. So a couple examples. But of course the idea is that there is an occluded block here and a blue occluded block. And if the robot has perspective taking enabled, it understands that because you couldn't see that, you probably didn't mean that to be part of the sample set. So the robot actually can interpret, just using basically Bayesian hypothesis testing, that the right behavior to generalize to is to fill all the blocks, including the block that's hidden, because that's what your intention was. So even though it was aware you, you didn't see it, it knows that that was the intended rule. 
so here you see him actually filling up the included block. So that's a perspective taking is enabled for the robot. And so the question is, does this predict um, what people do? So we did a task with people because we actually looked at a lot of the psychological literature to see uh, if work like this had been explored and we couldn't find anything. So we, we actually did the experiment with people where again, it's the exact same task, same sort of scenario just to get a sense of what, what, are, what are people doing. So this is, this is basically the same thing we did for the robot but now you did it with a person where a person would first fill, fill these blocks and then they would do another instance with the other colored blocks and the question is what do people learn? So is this a video of that? Anyway, so what you found is that if perspective taking for the robot was enabled, the robot actually learned the most common rule that the people learned in the same situation. So again, because the tasks were somewhat ambiguous, people might learn other things as well. But the dominant, most popular rule was what the robot would learn. So it's sort of a prediction or validation of this role of perspective taking and learning from ambiguous demonstrations from someone else. It turns out that often in this condition, what people would do is they'd pull out the blue block so you would see it and then fill it. So to, as if to say, I know that you meant for me to do all the blocks, you couldn't see this. So I'm gonna make that explicit to you. So it turns, it looks like these perspective taking skills, these social cognitive skills actually could play a very important role in how robots learn from people in the real world, especially in the case of cluttered environments and trying to really understand the instructor's intention and what they meant to, tench, meet, meant to teach even if the actual demonstration isn't quite right to do that. So I think this is, this is interesting. Um, another, so we, we did this work on this idea of social filters. This was a social cognitive filter. Another question was, well, are there other social filters? Are there other ways that we use space in our body in order to structure the environment to help the learner learn what we intend? So we did another study um, that involved, uh, again, looking at two people performing a task and then trying to validate these cues that, that matter. So how do this people use their body and movement of objects to structure a task to help, to help the learner learn the right thing? validate those cues on a robot that did the same thing with a person bringing in human subjects who've never interacted with the robot to teach the same sort of task. So there's two parts of this little project. So the question again is how the kind of embodied scaffolding. What do people do with their bodies or how they move objects to help a learner learn? So this was the, uh, the task. It's called a secret constraint task. So you had a, two humans, two human participants would come in. One is the teacher and one is the learner where uh, the teacher uh, the learner knows actually, the, so this is like a tangram puzzle test. There's these colored objects on a table, like you can see here. The learner actually knows the figure to be built, but it turns out there's a secret hidden constraint that the teacher knows that you have to teach the learner in order to succeed at doing the task. So if you didn't know the secret rule, you couldn't build that with the blocks that are available. So the learner knows the figure, but they don't know the secret constraint. And what we basically told people is, Teach the learner the secret constraint by any means that you wish, but you cannot talk. So we wanted to focus again on the use of physical interaction and manipulation. So they weren't allowed to talk, but they could do anything else in order to try to help the learner figure out this rule. So the question then is, what do people do? Because they could do a lot of things, and people do do a lot of things. So we captured a lot of data to try to back out what are the most significant things that people do that might give us a handle on these salient cues. So we, again, used a Vicon system to track people's head pose, how they were moving their bodies, gestures they might be using, pointing, and so forth. We created this sort of light table thing with an under, a camera underneath so you could see all the block manipulations. So you could track all the states of the blocks um, as well at orientation, shape, color, and so forth. So we gathered a lot of this data and the question then is, you know, of all of these things that people do do, and they do a lot, is there a sweet spot? Is there a certain set of limited cues that really give you a bang for the buck? And these are the things that maybe the robot should really be paying attention to in order to try to learn these kinds of tasks from people. So you see hand and head cues. You see how they m structure the blocks in terms of pushing blocks towards people or away or segment, you know, segregating them to different parts of the table. You see them doing both simultaneously and you see kind of like when people sit back and intentionally don't do anything. There's a lot of ways that people use their bodies um, and communication, nonverbal communication in order to structure this task. So I'll let you think about what these cues might be because if I tell you, you might say, oh, well, that's obvious. But if you look at all these cues, very few people actually get it right because um, it's not obvious if you're trying to really pick it out from this list. But it turns out that block movement 
towards and away from the learner is one of the most important cues to pay attention to. So if you plot all of these uh, colors of block movements towards the learner that the instructor does of the good blocks, the relevant blocks that they're saying these little blocks you should be using to do this task to learn that rule versus the bad blocks or the inappropriate blocks, they tend to move them away from the learner. And if you look at what their learner learns, they tend to really pay attention to this subset in order to learn the rule. So they're intuitively picking up on the spatial scaffolding cue in order to do this task. And here's some examples of the amount of block movements. So it turns out people move the blocks around a lot. If you put all the kind of distance of block movements over the sequence of even this, this task that's not that complicated, I would say, it's like a football field long in terms of all the amount of block movements that people are doing. So this is a very dynamic sort of task. There's a lot of activities going on. But you do see this very strong trend moving the good blocks towards the learner and taking the bl bad blocks away from the learner. And the learners intuitively pick up on this to learn the appropriate rule. So to validate this, what we did is we said, you know, for the robot Leonardo, we had, again, a basic sort of learning algorithm to be able to learn this sort of rule if the robot could pay attention to the right cues. So we added to the robot's attentional system, pay attention to the block movement, pay attention to just this cue, how much people move things towards you or away from you, and can you learn the appropriate rule. So we brought in 18 people. Uh, I think we advertise on Craigslist, so again, these are people that don't necessarily know anything about robotics. Um, and we did a, you know, a kind of virtual light table. Again, the robot's not super dexterous, so it can't physically manipulate blocks. But it can do this sort of Yoda thing, where it can kind of <laughs> manipulate the blocks <laughs> through this sort of interface. So you see this typical interaction where you know, the person sending them through the Vicon system, if the robot's trying to use a block that's not appropriate, you can take it away. And then you can dra drag relevant blocks. So I think this is like use the red and the blue blocks, but not the yellow and the green blocks. So the person is helping to structure the space, and the robot's paying attention to this and trying to, again, do this hypothesis testing of what is the rule that I need to do to figure the secret constraint. So at this point, again, just paying attention to these, this, this simple block movement rule, I think at this point the robot's actually figured out um, figured out the rule. So the, the task is to build a sailboat. So he's, he's got a planner. He knows how to build the figure. If you could just figure out what the rule is. And now you can see he's only using the red and the blue blocks in order to build the sailboat. So that's what he's doing here. Maybe one more piece. Maybe one oh, two more. OK. And then uh, to validate that, where the person leaves and the robot builds another figure um, following the same rule that it thinks is learned. So he's like, yep, I think that's it. So, so now the robot's going to clear off and now he's going to do another, another figure showing that it, it is actually this rule of only using the blue, I mean the, the red and the blue blocks. So in this case, he builds this little, um, still smiley face. <laughs> So, and it turns out that when you brought people off the street, the robot actually learned successfully 92% of the time. So that's pretty cool. I mean, it's often pretty hard to bring people off the street to teach your robot something like this. And the fact that the robot could actually learn 92% of the time means that there's something about these cues that are actually really are meaningful. So, so that's cool. Um, and then you could add on to this. You can integrate this. So um, I just thought this would be fun to share. Um, <laughs> in other work, We've been looking at reinfor uh, uh, reinforcement learning with options, so hierarchical reinforcement learning, where the robot is trying to learn how to control these two boxes here. So there's lights on this control box. There's lights here. It's hard to see it. But the idea is robots should be able to learn when you're not there. One criticism of a lot of the social learning work is that the robot can only learn when there's somebody there to teach it. But what if there's not a person there? What do you do then? So we've started integrating you know, these more uh, hierarchical reinforcement learning so that the robot, when there's a person not there, can explore on its own. It can try to play around these levels and see, see the consequences. There's a button, there's a lever, and there's a, a switch to figure out how do I control these two things to reveal the shape hidden underneath. And when a person is present, you want the robot to be able to take that scaffolding, to take that guidance. And here we're doing it a lot through dialogue in terms of highlighting you know, try this particular action, or look, you did this and that was good, so highlighting goal states to help the robot build a model um, of how to operate these two boxes. So he's exploring it and playing around and using the, impact, uh, the feedback from the person in order to learn a model for how to control these two, these two boxes here. 
So that's just showing this dynamic, flexible thing where the robot can and you know, can learn on its own, but it can also take advantage of the person when the person's present. And now he's learned the model, and now he's doing that sailboat task again. So the second part of the task is the robot's going to now learn this, build this figure where it's going to try to use, you know, the person's going to try to teach the robot what the salient um, rule is in order to do it. So it's kind of like a preference. Build a sailboat, but build it in the way I want you to. And the thing that's fun about this example is that two of the items that are needed are actually hidden under these panels. So the robot has to immediately apply what it learned in one context using a different style of learning in order to op reveal these shapes in order to complete the task. So it's just kind of a nice integration of different styles of learning and different styles of interaction into one more cohesive uh, task um, for the robot. So he's starting to build a figure. He notices that he's going to need something, I think a yellow square block or something. He goes, well, it's not there. I don't see it, but I know how to get it. And so he operates the control panel um, that he just learned to do. Oh, it's a blue block. And so he, he, he picks out the blue block. So this the interaction goes on. But it's, again, it's just kind of a nice example of thinking about robots that learn from people should be able to learn when people are not around as well as when they are around. When they are around, you want that to be leveraging the person as much as possible. So, so that's been kind of our evolution of thinking uh, up to this point where, again, just appreciating this, this way of thinking about this model of how to build robots that learn from anyone, again, is this richly collaborative model. And we've been grounding it in real empirical studies with people in order to figure out what are these cues that really matter, how do people actually try to teach robots, and then designing to support that to build robots that can actually be more effective learners. So it's a win for both. It's a win for the person because it's easier to teach the robot. It's more matched to how people teach, and it's good for the robot because often it actually learns better. It's more effective. So, so this is all well and good, and there's more work like this going on um, in the field. But you know, it's also a little bit unsatisfying as you're thinking about if there's a handful of professors around the world doing these studies, it's going to take us a long time before robots really learn about people. Because, I mean, the fact of the matter is robots just aren't on that much. <laughs> and they don't encounter people that often. So how can we start to take this experience question really seriously? Because we're not going to get there if we just keep doing these small controlled studies and labs. Um, so that's been influencing my thinking now. So this is the really new, 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 new stuff. My student literally was sending me the video at 6 o'clock this morning. Because I'm like, I really want to talk about this. I'm really excited <laughs> about it. So. <laughs> So one of the lessons we learned from this block movement task is that, of course, human behavior is diverse. People did do all that list of stuff on that table. But it turns out, as you've also got a sense from that example, what we do in common, we tend to do much more often. So although human behavior is very rich and complex, if we can figure out that sweet spot, which might be a much more constrained set and designed for that, then you might be able to build systems that are pretty damn good 95% of the time, and then it's more of this kind of tangential aberrant behavior that you need to do. So, so that was kind of one of the things that got us thinking in this direction. The other thing is just a lot of the work going on in other communities. So of course, human computation work, crowdsourcing work by Louis Van On. In robotics, data-driven approaches happening in the vision community, ha using 3D Google SketchUp models using Flickr labeled images in order to train classifiers for vision. Jeff Orkin had done a project at the Media Lab um, called The Restaurant Game, where he basically uh, had lots of people jack into a game and play uh, a waitress and a, and a client to get, learn models of dialogue and interaction to build a game AI that could then replace one of those players. Um, and you're starting to see more recently work in robotics, so crowdsourcing, grasping models for novel objects. I think this is a mechanical Turk. Sort of examples, so if the robot's looking at a novel object and doesn't know how to grasp it, it sends it out to the mechanical Turk and a person says, grasp it here. So you're starting to see this idea of how do we harness the internet, the wisdom of the crowds, to help robots learn or make sense of the world. So, so this is a project that um, when Sonia graduated from Manuela's group, she worked in my lab for a year as a postdoc. Um, on this project, and we've continued that collaboration now that she's on faculty at WPI. So Sonia is a big collaborator in this work. Jeff Orkin, who did the restaurant game, has been a great collaborator, and this is my student Nick De Palma, who's really been the uh, a hero, I think, to, to, to get all this data and, and, and get you this video. Um, so this is the idea, is can you crowdsource human robot interaction? We've seen a lot of crowdsourcing of images and things like that, but what about crowdsourcing interaction itself? And the big question is, if you can crowdsource it online, 
can you actually transfer it to a real robot in the real world with real people? So can you actually bridge the online behavior to the real world behavior? That was a big unknown. So this was the idea. Can you create a computer game? This is called the Mars Escape game. I think you can still play it if you go online. It was designed to be a collaborative task. So the scenario was, you know, your, your oxygen tank has exploded on Mars. You have to gather a set of scientific instruments. Um, within 10 minutes and leave in order to succeed at this game, where some of the tasks required explicit collaboration, some of them the robot could do, some of them the person could do. So it was a task that really was meant to look at ta collaborative task performance. The advantage, of course, is that you, I mean, a lot of people will do this. A lot of people will play these games, which is amazing to me, but they will. Um, <laughs> they will. And you can collect all of that data and then use that data to ground out behavior models for the actual robot. But the question is, can you transfer it? So the flip side was that we wanted to then, after we crowdsourced all of this data in the game, can you build this Mars Escape game it, at a physical place at the Museum of Science, we have lots of museum visitors, download those models, those memories from the game to a real robot, and then have the real robot perform the same task with real people who know nothing about robots. So, so that was the big question. Is this even viable? Is this strategy even viable? I mean, we were really like, if it worked, that would be huge, but we didn't even know if this would work. So again, this is just re-articulating, but this is the game. This is the strategy. So go online, get lots of data, see if you can learn these models, transfer to a physical robot that you could either use, well, so the robot could be virtual real. You could either do it to play the game, to be better game AI, but could you actually take it into the real world? And then the bigger vision, of course, is if you can record not only the virtual data here, but the real world data here, can you then feed that back and transfer that to yet another robot? So do you get the whole, I don't know, cloud robotics thing going at that point? So that's the bigger vision, that's the bigger game plan. So here's the game. So again, it's, it's Mars Escaped. Um, there's these three tasks that we want the robot to do. I already kind of told you this, so I'm gonna go uh, to the game itself. When we designed the game, we tried to design the robot so that it actually moved about the speed of the real robot, had the same kind of dexterity. So there was a lot of thought in the actual game design and the tasks so that it was robot-like in terms of what the physical robot was able to perform. Um, these are the set of tasks that we had the people do. So on one task, the human character had to climb up a set of stairs in order to get a book on top of boxes, so only the person could do that. Um, there was a captured, capture the alien task where the robot had to, or the person could operate a series of controls, a push button, whatever, to get that thing. There was a canister behind a chemical spill, uh, chemical spill where the person, you know, you would lose points if you got toxic, whatever, so the robot was better suited for that task. There was a memory chip thing. This was actually one of the most complicated tasks, I think. Oh no, the memory chip, uh, oh, so you had to have both the human and the robot go to a particular place at the same time in order to get that. And there was a sample box task. This is actually like a bunch of little bug boxes where the desired item was in one of them. And so the robot had a special sensor that could tell the astronaut which one to open, but they had to work together to do that task. So these were the five tasks that we had the person do. And this is basically what, what the game looks like. So text-based, people would t type in uh, uh, what they would want to say. So we captured a very interesting just dialogue model. People would say things relevant to the task, but they would also just say a lot of things. And they would type LOLs and, I mean, they would just do a lot. People would do a lot, okay? So uh, people do a lot, <laughs> that's all I'm saying, people do do a lot. Um, so one person would jack in and play the robot. So there's a human controlling the robot and there's another human playing the astronaut. So there are fundamentally two people here doing this task together. Um, and we're recording the entire game state. We're recording what was said, the sequences of actions, what objects were being held, the objects that were in the recovery box. So we're recording the entire, the entire game state. So that's just what I already said. <laughs> so we ran the game for about three months and we recorded uh, over 900 game logs, which again is kind of amazing how many people are willing to do this stuff. But we got it. And uh, you would see interactions kind of a lot like this in terms of if you record uh, the actions that people did as well as what was said. Um, they would often engage in kind of problem solving dialogues, of assigning actions, of coordinating their actions. So this was good, it was a good domain to look at collaborative behavior. Again, you would see a lot of other stuff like typos, colloquialisms and so forth. So the, the text speech might look very different from real speech. And there's kind of this, you know, I call the spaghetti on the wall. It's like, what's the first simple thing we should just try to do with this data to see if it could work at all? Is we basically took the corpus and we just applied it. In one case, we looked at um, case-based planning. In another case, we've looked at case-based reasoning and just generating behavior straight from these temporal plan networks as well. So again, this is just taking standard approaches and seeing 
as a first step, what does that generate? So you can build these plan networks. So you have these sequences of actions like this from the interaction log. So what is done when, what people say. And you can imagine forming a graph without a directed graph. And as you get more and more people doing this, you get you know, more and more sophisticated or complicated graphs of all the things between two possible states and actions, all the things that people did or all the things that they said in order to go from one point to another. So you can automatically generate this plan network um, so we used uh, stuff from Jeff Workin to do that. And when you do that, this is actually the resulting plan network. It's a mess. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff. It's hard to make any sense of it. But one of the key insights, again, is if you start calculating all the likelihoods and starting to say, what if we only keep the transitions that even just only 2% of the people also did? It starts getting a lot simpler. And if you say, well, what if you only keep the transitions that only 5% of the people did? it gets even simpler still. So now it starts looking really manageable. So this is just this insight that people do do a hell of a lot, but what we do in common, we tend to do a lot more often. And if you can design for that sweet spot, you might actually be able to design a system that can wrap its head around this. So, so that's one of the key insights that we've been playing with. So what do you do with this data? So again, we, we've put it in through a, uh, a case-based planning process. We looked at that, we've looked at a case-based reading uh, example. But there's a lot of plan segments there's, and there's a lot of cases that we're drawing from. And the question is, Okay, so and this is an example of some of the dialogues. And you can see, so if you have a human just typing in dynamically to the game and you have the plan network itself generating the utterances, where R is the, is the computer and A is the human person, the dialogues actually look pretty good most of the time. I mean, it's not always perfect, but it feels kind of very human-like, you know? So even at the end, I love that the ro robot says Roger Dodger. So again, it's because it's sourcing what people said, right? Um, so it's, it, yeah, it's intriguing. It's really intriguing. So I mean, it's on the online version, it looks pretty good. But of course, what we're trying to get in the new, new stuff is can you transfer to a robot? So now, when you take this game and you literally build the set, you build the set out in a space, this is that bug box task that's here. And you have people come in, if I calm them up or whatever, and try to actually do the task in the real world, does it work? That was the big question for us. Can you actually transfer it from the purely virtual to the real? So we built out the set, this is it. So we tried to emulate the game as, as faithfully as we could. Uh, we gathered in the physical robot condition, we gathered a number of conditions. So one was what we call just the teleoperated. So if a human actually controlled the robot, in some sense this might be considered the kind of gold standard baseline. So if the AI was actually human, we, we ran 19, 29 subjects where the robot was completely teleoperated to get this sense of what would that look like. And then we looked at two crowdsourced conditions. So one where the robot's actions were being generated through a case-based reasoning system. We ran that with 18 subjects. And we did another one where we did case-based, um, that's supposed to be case-based planning, so CBP, case-based planning where we ran 25 subjects. Um, the age range of people ranged from 11 to 45 years old, um, about 58% <laughs> male, 40% female. So these are, these are just people visiting the museum. So these are, these are just families. So, one of the things that was intriguing, and again, we just have this data, we're just starting to go through it now, so I think there's gonna be a lot of stuff we're gonna be covering, so this is literally hot off the presses. But Sonia was starting to look at, from the game logs, which you have you know, a lot, a lot of people, to the robot in the world, which you have many fewer instances, if you just get a sense of like how much time it took people to do stuff, this six, so it took, you had 10 minutes to do the task in the game, so this is basically six minutes. The amount of time is like kind of, divided by task, this is by task, is actually kind of similar. And that's kind of intriguing because in the game, again, the robot was designed to move in the game kind of to mirror what it would move like in the real world. But in the game, I mean, picking up something was instantaneous, whereas the robot actually has to reach out and pick up. So it takes a minute for the robot to pick up an object. Um, whereas in the game, it was instantaneous. But, you know, intriguing, even the distribution is kind of intriguing in that from the game to the real world, not crazy radically different. Okay, so I have not seen this video yet. I saw the first part of the video and it looked pretty good. <laughs> so we will, we will share this moment together. <laughs> uh, I think there's three phases. So one is kind of a complete thing through the game and I think one is kind of a funny thing that happened. So anyway, we'll, 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 we will discover together what this video does. My poor student at 5 a.m. I need that video! Okay, so. Uh, is it playing? Crowdsource behavior. Double click. Oh, there it goes, okay. So can you hear this? Because this is, so the robot's running speech recognition. 
It's running speech synthesis based on the game logs. There's a Vicon system tracking the robot, the people, and the objects. And so they're actually really doing this thing together. They're doing it. They're really doing it. So the robot's like, I'll go get the canister. You go do this. And so it's, you know, I can reach that. And it's going to go and it's going to pick up that canister and it's going to go put it in the box. Meanwhile, the person's going to figure out, what do I need to do next? So you got to speed it up. But I mean, you know, because I don't want to make you sit through a 10 minute video. But uh, at the kind of, you know, salient parts of interaction, so you get the robot and the person's doing some of their stuff. But they're talking, you know, they're talking, they're coordinating their actions. The robot's going to go do something up. But it looks like, it's like a collaborative task. So this is where the robot actually needs the person's help. So it's like, can you help me with this? So please put the object in the bucket. Okay, I hope it's still playing. So maybe the codec didn't go much further than that. Oh no, it keeps going. Okay, good. So I haven't seen this part at all. <laughs> Is it going? So I think. <laughs> so there it's, it's being repetitive. So this is a case based, this might be the case based reasoner showing that there's some repetition going on there. So again, the robot's behavior isn't perfect, but it's like, yeah, yeah skill. <laughs> so these are kind of the bloopers. These are kind of things where things are kind of funny. <laughs> 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 She's like, what? <laughs> I'm told there's a joke at the end. <laughs> okay, maybe this is last a little bit. Is it going? Is it going? I don't know. We were having issues with the codec this morning. But anyway, so I mean, it's intriguing. I mean, I think, again, this is really green and crispy stuff. But if you look at the amount of time it took to do do both tasks, just between the crowdsources is looking at the case-based planning versus the teleoperated, so the real robot teleoperated, if you look at the standard deviation, the average time, I mean, it's kind of in the same ballpark. And the thing that was really encouraging is if you look at the percentage of time that the robot was autonomous, so obviously in the uh, Wizard of Oz case, it's completely operated, so zero. The human operator, if the robot was really stuck in the real world, they could override what the robot was saying in order to kind of keep the interaction going. But 98% of the time, the robot was actually generating its own decisions and its own actions and its own dialogue. So only 2% of the time, so now you have 2%, um, did the person actually have to intervene. And it turns out a lot of this is actually kind of task specific. So I don't know if I have that slide. But that, that example with the bug box, I'll go back here. It turned out that a lot of people in the online game didn't succeed at that task either. So there were not a lot of examples of that for the robot to draw from. And so when, the, when, our, uh, when we had to intervene, a lot of it was around that kind of task. So if you just didn't have a lot of data, not surprisingly, it was more likely that you'd have to intervene. But surprising. I mean, for me, surprising that 98% of the time the robot was, 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 was generating its own, its own utterances and determining its own actions. So, this was it. It was basically a proof of concept. So I mean, this is, it was just, is this even viable? Is this even a strategy that we can approach this more data-driven science of HRI? And I think the answer is, yeah, I think, I think, it's, I think it's worth trying. So um, the next thing we want to do, we have, we have all the corpuses of the game. We have all of the corpuses from the real world. But now we want to combine those and then run it on a new robot, same class of robot as Nexi, but taller, more dexterous. Can you transfer it now to another robot? 
can you take all of these interactions and transfer? So this is now getting into the big hive mind collective where if all these robots were crowdsourcing all of these interactions and transferring it to other robots, that's kind of the bigger, the bigger vision. So that's the next thing you want to do. So of course this is this bigger cloud, and I think there's a lot of discussion around cloud robotics now. Can we build an HRI cloud? Can you have all these online interactions? I don't know, things like Second Life. Can you have real robots in the real world interacting with people, going to the cloud, feeding into the collective, having both, we started off talking about social learning, you want the robots to be learning from people. You want them to be able to learn on their own. You want them to be able to learn from their own first-hand experience, but then can they also feed that back in the cloud? So that's like the big, the big idea. Can you get to this point? Um, so I think this is really exciting. And you know, there's initiatives, I guess there was an EU, recent EU-funded pro project to do the internet for robotics. I mean, I think this is a very kind of zeitgeist idea. And you're starting to see a lot of people trying to think about how can we harness this internet and the fact that so many people are on it to help Robotics, I think it's really intriguing. And the reason why I'm also interested in is what I'm really trying to get to in the next five to 10 years is really start looking at long-term interaction. So how do you build up this common sense, this social common sense for robots sourced from the crowd so that, I don't know, 90, 95% of the time, I mean, the robot is pretty reasonable in terms of dealing with general kind of populations, but then also how can you think about the longitudinal relationship with an individual? So there's the kind of general ability that you can argue what we've looked at is kind of like the ability to do this task with the general population. I'm also interested in that individual relationship. So a robot really gets to know you. And there's a whole history of interactions particular to you that the robot should be referencing and crowdsourcing as well. So those are these two kind of bigger research themes that um, we're really trying to get to. Um, and again, this is just, this is just the, first, the first project. Uh, related to this, um, I'll just quickly say it. Well, we're starting to do this little fluffy robot here. We're starting to build Android phone robots. So the idea is can we build inexpensive robots that we can put in real environments like schools and so forth um, where you power it through the Android phone as much as possible. And these phones are getting pretty capable. Um, there could be a computer that's also helping to, to, to get to the data collection and stuff like that. But can you set up a remote field lab where in some sense these robots are out there, you're recording these interactions, you're crowdsourcing these models, you're uh, updating them, you're setting them back so over the time the robots get more intelligent over time, but doing it as a remote field lab where the robots are actually in the wild interacting with people. So we're, we're trying to think about this leveraging, again, I mean this just Android phone cloud computing framework in order to do that. So that's, that's a parallel project to the online gaming, that's a parallel project that we're trying to think about how you, can you build that out now. So that's, that's really the deal. Um, and I guess that's the end of the talk. So this is something about how people were rating the robots um, people enjoyed it. Uh, they thought the robot was a good teammate. Um, there was a little bit of, uh, you know, for clear communication, there was more issues there for the robot. You could hear in some of those videos it would be repetitive in what it would say. But in general, they liked the teamwork. Um, they thought the robot was, had rational actions and predictable behavior. But in the case of the museum robot, a lot of them figured it was actually controlled uh, by a computer. So, you know, an intriguing thing is what do you need to do to get you know, this to look like this, so it seems much more human-like. So that's, um, that's what I had today. So I will take questions. Do you have time for questions? Uh, I'll break it down. Yep. Uh, first of all, compliments, it's really great stuff. Oh, thank you. Uh, with a lot of crowdsourcing probably coming from very young people and a, a very ripe and probably important target for robots, is personal robots, being fairly old people, mm -hmm. uh, isn't there something of a, a mismatch there that might uh, cause the robots to be much better to interact with other young people rather than yeah. older people? I mean, I think it depends how you do it. So there are a lot of older people online now too, and those numbers are growing. So, I mean, I think the idea would be if you could if you could capture these large populations and you could filter it by age group or whatever demographic. I mean, you could potentially get behavior that's more tailored to a particular user group. I mean, we're obviously nowhere you know close to doing that yet, but I could see how it could be potentially possible in order to do that. I mean, another hypothesis would be if the robot is kind of a younger hip robot, maybe that's actually fun for for people, you know, you kind of get that youth and exuberance and, and how it interacts, maybe that's a good thing, I don't know. I like the Roger Dodger kind of comment the robot makes. <laughs> uh. So I don't know if it was just the clips in the video, but 
it looked like when in the real robot game, as opposed to the simulation, the robot was taking most of the initiative. Hmm. And I'm, we've we've had this problem with let's say like with world reception mm -hmm. where the person has to take almost all the initiative. Mm -hmm. And that mixed initiative, mm -hmm. especially when there's conflicting goals. Yep. That's that's I think a hallmark of human yep. social interaction. Yep. And how do you how, how do we how do we deal with that? So I mean, again, I haven't gone through a lot of the videos, so I don't know. That's one of the things we want to look at is how much mixed initiative mm -hmm. there was. There were certainly examples I can tell you were just eyeballing it. The case-based planning system produced much more dialogue and chattiness than the case-based reasoning system. So it could be that, I mean, obviously, the way the robot interacts with you is going to encourage more or less social behavior from you. Um, so I don't know. I mean, certainly in the game, very mixed initiative. Right. So the hope would be, if that was a very mixed initiative, you could get that in the real robot case as well. Some of it might just be people's unfamiliarity with a robot. I come into a museum of science, I see this robot, I'm not exactly sure what to do. So a, a bigger question, which of course gets to this longer term stuff, is when you interact with something over time, what does that look like versus the first encounter? You could design this task where maybe the robot, um, you know, depending on how it conducts a task, it, it elicits more interaction from you first, like what do you think I should do? I mean, you can imagine maybe trying to bias it that way. Right. But in terms of, I mean, this sort of, you know, called the spaghetti on the wall thing, it's a first attempt and it's just intriguing for me. But we really have to go through, we have to go through the data and the dialogues and see what that behavior really looks like. And then there's just a huge opportunity to make it better. Because, I mean, this was really like, let's just try it and see if it's even viable. There's a long way you could go to make it better. Uh, I'm really just kind of surprised it worked as well as it did. So, so the, one of the things is that in, in especially in planning, plan-based behavior, there are goals, yep. right? And they tend to be task goals and not yep. social goals. Yep. So I'm wondering if, if we encode social goals yep. as part of the plan, and those social goals include, um, you know, turn-taking. Yeah. Okay. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I mean, I think, I mean, I'm not advocating that the way to do this is all the way through online games. I mean, the reason why you want to build physical robots in the real world is to try to get these other richer sort of social interactions no, as well. No, but the point is that, that it looked like the online game had a lot of mission This, issues. well, so, right, so, online. right, so this, so this particular game was a very task-oriented game. If you look at the restaurant game data, it's much more about hanging out and social interaction. So you see a lot more dialogue. I mean, you could literally do anything you want in that game. So you have people go steal the cash register and leave. I mean, you see anything. So I think it, it depends on, on, on the activity to get your data set. So I think you could create activities that try to capture these other kinds no, I of. Was actually, I was actually making a different point. Oh, OK. That in order to encourage the mission initiative, yep. rather than having your goals be purely task goals. Right. There might be also hard coding or, or having social goals social be. Goals. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely, yeah. No, I think, I mean, there's so much, there's so much more um, that could be done here. Oh, Chris, didn't we argue enough this morning? <laughs> I come in and I'm like, holy moly, this is like the most intense half an hour I've had to spend. <laughs> No, this is about people in Boston? What? <laughs> figure out what it is, yeah. And it really surprises me that you don't get any customers in this demo who get annoyed with the robot because it's so slow, yeah. and they run around and do all the tasks themselves. You do see some of that. From, from anecdotally, what I've been, so again, I haven't seen all the videos, but from, so some people are like that. Some people will go and do most of it themselves, and then it's done. Some people will watch and let the robot do as much of it as possible, and some people are more mixed initiative. From what I'm hearing from, from Nick as he looked through these videos and being at this, at this site, I don't know what the distribution is of that, but I, it sounds like there were definitely some people who were like, I'm just going to do it now. How does a robot so. learn to deal with these Very politely. No. <laughs> I think, you know, you could potentially think about how you could get lots of experience, like probably like what call centers. How do call center people <laughs> deal with rude, irate people? I, you know, I think part of it is, I think, getting examples. And a, a lot of the, the underlying theme of this is just how do we get many, many, many more examples that the robots can use to ground out its behavior. So, so can you get more examples of that? Labeling is, this is a good thing, do hmm? this. This is a bad interaction. 
direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, potentially, yeah. Or something. Yeah. Some way to, to, to guide behavior. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think these are all great questions. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think these are all, all great questions. I think, you know, when we're doing the little robots with kids, I mean, I'm definitely expecting this much more. I mean, it's going to be a very different interaction, let's just put it that way, than, again, these kind of people going through the museum. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the importance of getting robots into very different kinds of scenarios and environments and populations and just try to get a sense of what does that behavior look like in the wild and make sense of it and contribute back to it. I think the intriguing thing here is the robots can be an active agent in trying to get additional information. Like, oh, I did this and actually the person got really mad and left. And maybe another robot could actually use that as information to say, well, maybe I shouldn't do that, but maybe I should try this. Oh, and when I did it, it worked out really well. So I mean, I think that collective kind of thing is really intriguing. Um, how you can learn, learn from the whole group. Uh, yeah. I get the impression Leo does not have recognition of facial like emotions and such on the face and such. Oh, well, so in those videos, I mean, in other instances, yes, it does. In those, no, because we just, yeah, you know, we didn't compile that and into the program. Does that have any, any quantitative or qualitative effect on the, on the interaction? I mean, I think that, you know, there'd be such a rich, uh, um, you know, so much data there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly think if you're, if you're going to look at, say, long-term interaction, I think that those effective cues are going to be really important to people to sort of, build this sort of sense of, of, of relational uh, interaction with the robot. We've looked at explicit cases of social learning, like social referencing, which is all about picking up on what that person's effect was in order to figure out this thing good for me or bad for me to shape its behavior. So we've done explicit stuff looking at emotion, recognition, and interaction. Um, I think for children and learning, having the robot being able to understand what the child's excitement, frustration is, and respond dynamically and appropriately to that is going to be really important, which is partly why I'm really interested in looking at kids as a population, because I think that's going to be a very, very important part of that, uh, that interaction. The, the block, the, you know, moving the blocks around, they weren't allowed to talk. Right. But, but it wasn't recognized there, so that pleasure, displeasure, right. you got it right, you got it right. Yeah. Uh, would that, you think that would have a qualitatively, uh, you know, an effect on it, or just? We didn't actually, we, so in that particular task, the spatial scaffolding cues were the most significant. People did smile and you know you know they weren't allowed to talk but you got effective there was effective content in how they were interacting certainly um, but again it was more of this task to say we don't want you to talk as you could talk if the task is like pointless so you know we had to structure it in a way to get that that spatial scaffolding stuff but I do think the the social emotional connection and interaction and shaping especially for again these learning tasks health tasks too I suspect is really important and interesting yeah Heather! <laughs> Great luck. Great luck. <laughs> uh, how do you vet who participates in these online uh, studies? And you think that's going to depend on the field? Yeah, so we. Field? Yeah, we didn't vet it at all. So basically, people, we advertise the game and people would just play it. If anything, we'd filter based on if people finished the game or not. They had to at least do the game in the questionnaire for us to use their data. And there were a lot of people who would leave like part way through, in which case we just wouldn't use their data. So that was the only kind of filter we applied was did they actually do the, the final questionnaire. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you could potentially imagine, like we're talking about here with particular populations, wanting that sort of demographic information to figure out, we want models for this kind of community or this kind of group, and so we want to source behaviors from that kind of group to make it more appropriate for them. I think it's, it's interesting. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not hogging it. Um, so you, you, you were talking, you were talking just before about um, uh, you know the, the children, children's behavior shaping the robot. But one of the things it seems to me that, that, that at least my robots do very badly, and that's one of the reasons why people kick them or abuse them, is that they don't provide enough feedback yep. about. That transparency is huge. Yeah. No, not, not even the transparency. Oh. Well, ab about about the impact the you know the impact that the person's behavior is having on, on it. The is that yeah. what you mean by transparency? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So so you want that you want that deeply coupled system, and so, so. So when they when they punch the robot, if the robot doesn't react, doesn't react, then okay, well. It's they don't know if it's, it's right, robot. right, and they don't know if it's socially appropriate or not. So yeah, yeah should I do more and of it or less of it? We have we have, we have yeah. uh, 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 robot receptionists in Qatar, and 
and <laughs> there, there are the guards there um, uh, propose marriage like continuously <laughs> to this robot. <laughs> you know, these are these are you know devout Muslims who you know you wouldn't think that they would do that in order to a real person, but uh, you know they have no compunction about doing that to a, <laughs> to a robot. Yeah. And the ro actually the robot says you know this, you know things well. I'm not going to marry you or something like that, whatever. I don't remember what it says, but... I'm leaving. I'm not taking any serious relationships right now. <laughs> right, right. But they don't believe it. But they, it, it's, it, it, the, the interesting thing is, is, is that the people don't... The suspension of disbelief goes only so far. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They just, they're just they just not willing to accept the fact that this thing really has, you know, emotions or feelings or anything, and they can say anything to it, and it doesn't matter. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know how to get around that, that seems to be really key if we're going to put robots out in the wild and have them survive. Yeah, so I mean, again, I think the more experience these systems can get and learn from, I mean, I think that's got to be a key part of it is robots just don't interact with people enough to know what the hell we're about. So how do you take the experience part of this seriously? That's, that's kind of what this is about. How do you take the experience part of this seriously so robots have enough experience interacting with people that it has a framework or a common sense or a basis of knowledge that we acquire for years of growing up and dealing with preschool and everything that we take for granted, but robots have none of that. So how do you help them get that? So it's basically saying learning is great, but we got to take experience seriously, experience seriously if we're going to get somewhere with this. Force them to go through high school. Force them to go through. Oh, there's a lot of learning in high. There's a lot of learning in preschool. There's a lot of learning in high school. Exactly. Social learning. Uh, a lot of social learning in well, all throughout school. So all throughout schools. Yeah. All right. Good. Well, thank you very Great, much. Great, thank you.